Good morning. I hope you're all staying healthy and safe. We are going to talk about the S, the social, when we talk about the ESG, we talk about environmental, social, and governance issues. And we are going to talk about the S. Many times uh, you're going to see that the press or companies or even financial sector put a lot of emphasis now on environmental with, with new costs, I would say, because we uh, are trying to confront, obviously, the climate crisis. Uh, but social issues also have proven to be quite important. And I think uh, many times they can be a, a little challenging if you if you want in the way you measure them. And companies have been more used to measuring governance issues probably first and now environmental issues. Uh, and there's a lot of regulation coming in. And if you look at the green taxonomy, a lot of help, I would say, on the on the environmental side. But sometimes the social side seems a little bit more flu. Uh, and, and Christina is going to come and tell us precisely that it's not that way, that we have already a, a battery of things in our hands um, that, that we should tackle without having to create esoteric indicators. But this is also a, a pretty re relevant issue. No? So we are going to talk why human rights in particular uh, matter for investors or should matter uh, in investment decisions. No, and I think we are at the doors here in Switzerland to have an important referendum where we are going to talk about uh, responsible business initiative and where precisely part of that is if companies need to prove that they don't damage human rights, not actually so for, there is a lot of discussion if we're reverting the proof that, that we presume innocence or not, or if you really have to do this. Uh, so uh, I think it's a very timely discussion, but we're not going to talk about the initiative in particular. We could have some comments, but the, the idea is not to really focus on, on the political side or a debate on the initiative, but more on the broader idea and why it matters to incorporate at the core of your strategy uh, social criteria or social issues and why really... Um, they are becoming more, and I think if there is a silver lining to this COVID crisis, it's very hard to find the silver lining, is that companies that are good or that had a good grounding on the way they deal with social issues, especially on health and safety, on uh, inclusion in the value chain and, and other issues, have performed better and have been able to, to be more resilient. Now, Really, the and actually the background of, of of ESG can be traced to the Quakers if you want, but a more current one, uh, ESG really started to gain momentum even on the investment side with the apartheid in South Africa. No, and it was precisely to confront human rights violations and the apartheid that investors were called not to invest or disinvest or disengage from South Africa to push for change. So I think it is in the DNA of thinking about responsible investing, how uh, we look at social issues. And I think also COVID-19 has given uh, these issues a, a new breath, I would say, or a new, a, a new push. You know? And if you think about ESG funds, again, uh, financial funds that focus or have incorporated in environmental, social and governance criteria have attracted at the almost or I think for the last um, data I've seen 70 billion dollars from April to June of 2020 really pushing the assets under management of more than 1 trillion and so this is not really a, a small peanuts as it was in the past in responsible and sustainable investing is really uh, becoming mainstream and really, the other side of the story is also that 94% of ESG funds have outperformed the benchmarks during Q2 of 2020. So it's getting a lot of talks. If you look at, uh, at Bloomberg Green or if you look at any of the, of the news, you're going to see a lot of reports of the business case to actually include the ESG criteria into the investment. Obviously, a lot of that, that outperformance came from the low price of oil. Uh, but after the price of oil recovery in Q2, they're still outperforming. You know? So understanding the, the value or the business value of, the, of including ESG criteria and in investment decisions matters. 
and also understanding how corporates can incorporate this criteria for their own business model transformation, because obviously investors will invest in businesses and we're talking public traded companies, but also we could look at impact investing or more uh, private vehicles too in, in the way that businesses can have a positive impact on society and the environment. You no, know? so um there's also if you look at the top quantile of the social sustainability index, Hermes shows in the ESG data that they can they have really outperformed the bottom quantile uh, quintile. So that of, of what we call the social laggards or those that are not paying that much attention to social issues. So the business case is becoming more and more compelling. But uh, around the business case, it's also uh, not only about the business case, but it's also about doing the right thing. You know? So there is also the principal side of the, sto the story. Can you afford really not caring about social issues, about your own workers, about... So how do we marry the two stories? And I think in the social side, and we're going to talk together with, with Christina today and, and based on a little bit on her experience, um how how we do this uh in in a systematic way if you want and i want to show you that uh, there are a lot of stakeholders that are pushing to incorporate these issues and we've seen from the an activist side um from the investor side too but there's also a lot of regulation coming as we mentioned switzerland will have this referendum but this is not an isolated type of and very unique kind of initiative and i'll Again, I will not go into this this slide. It is coming from Julie Wine, actually a common friend that that introduces with Christina. Uh, but you can see that there is hard law and soft law incorporating human rights and social issues into the way we look at corporates. And and you're going to see that it's all around Europe, but also other countries. You no, know? and and if you look, it's getting heavier and heavier towards the end of your time of our timeline. No? So if you look at 2020, you're going to see different initiatives happening in Switzerland, in Spain, in Belgium, there is an EU initiative. And as I mentioned before, when we when we talk about the, when I mentioned the green taxonomy, there is also discussion about a social taxonomy coming in. So we are putting at the center of um business strategy and investment decisions and capital allocation also uh, social and environmental criteria and how we become um how we report but how can we strate strategically and intentionally pursue uh, corporate strategies that benefit society and people now um uh, so I will ask you a little question just to get you warmed up. And I want to see what human rights do you know? If this is not like a, a, an exam. No, I'm not uh, quizzing you like in school. But if you had to think about human rights, no, what human rights call your attention? And Praveen is telling me that already in, he's in Canada and it's already 18, minus 18 degrees. Oh no, that's not that cold here yet. So tell me some human rights. Any of you can mention human rights. So write in the chat, sorry, write in the chat. Right to life, right to self-determination, right to flourish. Hi Elko, good to have you. And it's good because I see some of you that are we have a few people that come to a lot of these webinars. So I'm very happy to see you. Any other rights? Right to feel safe. Perfect, Sujal. Hi, Sujal. Freedom of speech. Right to one's agency. Excellent. Right to equal access. Right of freedom of expression. Right to demonstrate. Equal before the law. Life with dignity. And as you see, we have many, hi, Robert, hi, Winnie. Oh, that's good. A lot of good friends of this webinar. So we have a great audience. So I'll, I'll expect you to be, Anish and Anton, to keep uh, very active today, the conversation, labor rights. Uh, some in debate is Anish is saying, but it, it, it's, it's true that labor rights also are becoming part of the forefront of what's happening now and good governance. So 
freedom of thought and freedom of religion. So as you see, we have a, ooh, you're getting even more political, Guille. He's saying affordable health care. I think the, the discussion in the US is going on right now. No? Um, the right to live your life free of discrimination, non-discrimination, precisely with and Christine. So you see, as you see, I think we are talking about human rights and many of us probably in, in, in the audience today, a lot of these things we have the luxury to take for granted. You know, many of these things are part of a regular life. And it's like what, obviously, if you think it, it is actually what it means to live a life in dignity. You know? So I find sometimes very puzzling, and I know I live in my own bubble, you know, uh, to think that we may look at business models that actually do not respect what we call these basic freedoms or human rights. No, but the reality is that we see violations going on all the time. So how do we revert business models that intentionally or not have been uh, not paying enough attention, even if they're not violating necessarily human rights, but not putting at the forefront of strategy some of the social issues? And how can we bring them into, into the picture? You no. Know? And as usual, before we start and do a little bit of house house cleaning, uh, we've been talking about the uh, through the chat. Now I will ask you not to use the chat and to use the Q&A in the bottom, because the advantage of the Q&A is that when you see a question, if somebody asks a question to the speaker uh, and somebody else likes it, you can click on the like that question will pop up to me. So I will see that, that two, three, four, five people that might be interested on in that question and it will help me to ask the speaker. Please ask as many questions as you can to make it lively and to make it real. And I will uh, get Christina and I will ask Christina to answer. We also have Patrick Reichardt here with us, a research fellow at the LEA Center that will support us uh, a little bit with the Q&A, but I obviously will be uh, looking at uh, the Q&A uh, all the time. So to introduce you to uh, to Christina, Christina uh, Tonsenis, she's a lawyer and a recognized leader in the effective and concrete operationalization of international human rights standards. And this is why um, we had very interesting discussions and I wanted to share what, what, what we talked with you. And she has really more than 20 years of experience in advocacy in human rights reporting, monitor, evaluation, even also in policy making and negotiating at national, international levels. Now, from 2011 to 2020, so right up to the beginning of this year, uh, she created the International Law Unit at the IOM, IOM the International Organization for Mig Migration, a, a UN organization, where she served as the head of the unit. Now, in that role, she built the or, uh, organization-wide policies and guidance of how to oper operationalize, report, and monitor impact programs from a right-based right perspective. And I think that's a little bit of what we're going to talk today, you know, how you develop indicators, methodologies to measure and to leverage the benefits of human rights to, to societies. And currently, Christina started uh, her own project. So she founded KPNK with other uh, partners, Impact Solutions, in, in early 2020. And uh, she's helping companies and investors precisely to effectively operationalize ESG criteria. So welcome, Christina. I'm very thank you, thankful for, for being here with us. It's such a privilege to have you. And really, let me start with a question uh, and, and to think, how do you see or how do you use these rights that we've seen a long list now on the chat, but how do you see human rights when uh, you start thinking about the internal processes of investors or companies? How do you make these rights very concrete uh, to use in strategies and also maybe with the accountability and the side that comes with reporting? 
So welcome. Well, first of all, well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me. The privilege is all mine. Well, I would say that, but then it sounds as if I'm stealing the privilege from you, which obviously is not my intention. <laughs> I guess it's mutual. No, but thank you. And thank you so much to those of you who have joined. I know there is an acute webinar fatigue, so I, I, feel, I, I feel quite extraordinarily uh, privileged to have you in, in the audience. So I think that what we really, what I really try to use is, is the experience I've had in the multi, multilateral setting for so long and in implementing really human rights standards all around the world in, in extremely complex settings. Um, the experience I have with IOM gave me something that is probably quite unique from the other UN agencies, and that is that we are so feel, well, after 15 years, you hand in your badge, you still say we. So, so field-based, so it is very much about implementing uh, existing norms, apart from also doing the advocacy and policy work with, with governments and with other agencies and other actors. So when we, um, when we approach this, what we, what we do with our, our counterparties will be investors or businesses is to say having a policy or strategy is, is not something that is just a piece of paper which you put on your shelf and then you say, oh, we have a nice policy. It has to be something that really guides you in your sustainability, in your ESG measuring, in your ESG establishing your indicators. And also, I've heard a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, some people actually say that ESG is about, me is about measuring what's already been done and it's not forward looking. For us, it's very much one part of the alphabet soup, which also includes obviously SDGs and UN guiding principles and on business to say, how do you use these environment, social governance concepts to move forward and actually do better? And also, how do you then link that to an already existing framework? Because another thing we've heard a lot is that you need to have better harmonization on reporting. And for me, that, that doesn't come from having 500 different questionnaires with 250 questions that might actually not fit a firm's or an investor's profile. But if you report and if you're strategy and your policy and your internal processes are linked to the international legal framework, then you actually already have, an harmonize, have a harmonization. So for us, it's very important as lawyers to remind private actors that the, the duty bearer, as we say, on international norms is the state. It's up to the state really to enact legislation that respect international norms. It's up to the state to have a legal process in place so that people who do not, do not follow these norms can be held accountable. But since human rights specifically, but international norms generally, has an acute impact on our daily lives. And I think that came out quite clearly in the questions. Uh, for instance, I, I took a few notes of the right to flourish, flourish, the right to feel safe, the right to agency. Um, those are all rights that actually, from a legal perspective, do not exist. But that is actually what human rights are about. The right to feel safe is also comes also from respect from for the for the rule of law. It comes from respect for everybody's rights so that we can walk down the streets safely without being afraid of being robbed or mugged by people. And I'm not saying that people who are in horrible situations will all become criminal. I'm just saying if I did not have the means to live, I would be much more like to try to steal a loaf of bread than I am today when I can pay for, for it. So it is about being safe. And human rights really were created originally as a safe space for the individual and for groups of individuals against an actor which is so much stronger than the individuals, which is the state. But that's the original the origins. Now we see really that human rights are very important for each and every one of us. And I think that there was somebody from Canada who mentioned that it's already minus 18 degrees Celsius. I am betting that that person is very, very happy to have, a, I'm here, I'm pretending or presuming that you have a house, uh, that it's heated, that you can close your door and feel warm, have something to eat. You probably had an education, uh, Healthcare. Somebody mentioned free healthcare. I think that free basic healthcare is indeed a human right, and access to services is 
is what makes human rights meaningful because you can have all those rights on paper, but if you don't have access to education, if you don't have access to healthcare, then all of these things become uh, irrelevant. So I think it's very important that we all realize that that sort of like high level international framework has an acute importance for each and every one of us. So we might find the rights in the international framework, but in most cases, it will also be in national legislation. And that is exactly one of the things that your, your very, very dense slide showed, is also that there is now a recognition of the role that private companies, be it businesses, corporations, SME, SMEs, or investors actually play in the um, in the progressive realization of human rights. And what we call it is, if we can go to another slide, next slide. Uh, are we showing it? Because I can't see if we're showing the screen. I have to admit to be completely IT are. challenged. Okay. Um, well, I also want to say that, for, oops, sorry, that there is a, a, a terminology that, um, next one. Okay. Well, that um, private actors have a duty to respect uh, international law. That comes from the UN, UN guiding principles. And what's important there is that the, that's a terminology that actually comes from when we talk about international law and the duty bearer of states. States have three levels of obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill. For a state, respecting means that you don't harm human rights. The obligation to protect is much more uh, elaborate in the sense that the state needs to take steps to actually protect from violations. Now, as a private actor, you might think that the obligation to respect is a little bit, let's sit back and not do anything. But since a private actor is fundamentally different from a public actor, the obligation to respect for private actors means something different because a private actor does not have the obligation to protect as a state. It cannot enact legislation. It cannot uh, establish uh, courts that protect against all that then fulfill once we have had violations. So for a private actor to respect, you actually need to take active steps so that you need to, for instance, in your business, make certain that labor rights are respected. Let me ask you uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I had a question here, now it moved a little bit, but can you tell us how businesses can help and protect? And, and here, Anton is asking very specifically, migrants are refugees. So we'll move a little bit from so if we think of from a human rights perspective, why do migrants and refugees may matter for, for businesses? Or if you have seen any examples. I mean, my first thought is obviously that it is in, in labor situations. So I think that there are various levels. Um, first of all, some of you mentioned the right to non-discrimination. So in the sense, the right not to be discriminated. Obviously, that goes also for nationality and it goes for what, what we call migration status. In many destination countries around the world, you will have a, a number of irregular migrants working uh, because many destination countries in these days are having migration policies which are pampering to political sentiment, which is not really corresponding to the reality of what destination countries actually need for their labor force. Um, and so there is the, the, that various levels. One is get engaged in policy and advocacy processes and try really to make the business point that we need as destination countries that labor force. I don't want to picture uh, migrant labor only as you know something that something that's useful for the labor force because we're talking about human beings. But it's incredibly important that central governments understand that if they keep up not having legal channels for migration, then we will have irregular migra migration and irregular migrants because the labor market needs that labor. And irregular migrants are, first of all, vulnerable to exploitation because they're outside the system. They will be threatened uh, to go to the police. They will not know what uh, channels there are to use when you are uh, being exploited. They are actually also creating uh, unfair competition for the national workers. 
not for fault of their own, but because the employ the employer will be, I'm not saying all employers are bad, uh, so, some would not do this, but it's tempting to not pay minimum wages, to not have conditions that you would give to national a national workforce who would actually know their rights and stand up for their rights. So standing up for irregular migrants' rights in the labor market is actually about also standing up for ourselves so that we all compete at the same level. So there is the uh, the first step, so to speak, is try to regularize anybody who works in your supply chain, in, in your business, make certain that if that's not possible for one reason or another and you're working in a gray area, you give the same rights to regular migrants that you give to the national labor force. And really, really importantly, try to engage the central governments. And I'm saying central because many local authorities are doing an amazing job in trying to actually get migrants and refugees really integrated in societies because they see the damage it does to their societies if groups are living on the margins. But central governments seem to have a very hard time understanding that any destination state uh, in these days really need legal labor channels. And that would also remove some of the pressure from what is right now being, um, which is right now the, the channels that are, for instance, for refugees or for vulnerable migrants. Because the more people you allow in without making them vulnerable because of closed orders, uh, or, and here, let me make a parenthesis, I'm not advocating for open borders. I'm not advocating for abolishing borders. I'm saying that legal channels is something that is established, for instance, regionally, bilaterally, which correspond to business needs in the destination center. Good border control comes with it so that you know who comes in, for what reason, on your territory. And also, and this is another thing, we all know that trafficking and smuggling is in the hands of big international criminal organizations. If we manage to establish more legal channels for migration, we will take a lot of business away from these people and channel a lot of money into the regular uh, economy. John so, is pushing back a little bit on, on this idea because you're saying, okay, less companies, let, let, let less company legalize workers. And even though he's not talking specifically about migration, but he's saying, I applaud your distinction between condemnation and engagement, now that you should engage and work proactively, uh, asking people and companies and institutions. But how confident are you and what level of expect of awareness do you expect? Or compared to maybe a checklist approach that a company would say, okay, I have a policy that I say I don't hire illegal immigrants to the best of my knowledge. Or I have a, so I ask all my providers not to have child labor. No? How do you see the, the change in the mindset of, of corporates maybe uh, I, to this more think, engaged think, kind of yeah behavior. i think i mean being somebody who's worked on promoting uh, international standards specifically human rights non-exploitation for the past 25 years i have come to the realization that we need to be very happy for small steps of progress I do not like anything that is green or blue washing or washing in general. Well, I mean, I, I do like taking my clothes to the dry clean and put them on clean, but that sort of washing, no. But it does show a, a when, an awareness that we can no longer pretend that we don't care about these things. At least, I mean, even those who are actually maliciously greenwashing are by now aware that they need to do that. So I know this is this could seem really bad, but when I started working on human rights issues 20 years back, uh, there were a number of states who really had a very strange discourse. There's still a number of states with a strange discourse, but so sort of saying, yes, we don't really care, uh, human rights not for us. Then it changed a little bit to saying, yes, we don't really care, but we don't violate it. And now there's more and more sort of scrutiny on when you say we don't violate. So I think that even those who are now only greenwashing or bluewashing or whitewashing, whatever it is that they're doing, there is this awareness that you need to at least pretend. Now, pretending is not enough, but there is that that's going on. 
I also see a real interest in actually having impact and actually doing better. Some of it is utterly and completely misplaced, not for lack of having the heart in the right place or wanting to do good, but because for private actors, did this is relatively new. So, uh, and unless there is a, let's say, cross fertilization between the the world, such as the public sector and the UN, where, where people have been doing this for 25 years, and the private sector, where there's a real engagement, I think we might see some missteps, but they will not necessarily be out of ill will. It will be because this is new. I personally think that just to tick the box is... It's something that can raise awareness. Oh, there's a box here that says something about that. That means I need to be aware of it. Our approach is when we really engage with somebody is to say, yes, we want to write or do together with you your strategy, which is going to be linked to international standards. For instance, we say there is a right to water. Now, that's well and fine. And somebody will say, I'm working specifically on clean drinking water or not polluting in the in the companies I invest in. Now, that will usually then be reported as the SDG for water, and I have forgotten the number. It's really mm -hmm. important to link that also to the S because it would usually be an environment indicator. No, we worked on the right or we worked on clean water. But for the surrounding society, that's super important because you have areas in, in the world where people have to walk through three kilometers to get dirty water. If you work on that, then you actually have an impact on the surrounding society and those people will then be able to do something else. For instance, study. So it will have this trickle out effect. The more you study, the more options you will have in life. The more you will be able to make informed choices, the more you will be able to engage in meaningful labor, for instance. Now, um, and we I think also... Uh, sorry, interrupt you two seconds, but I think Anish is also asking uh, about value chains, and I I've seen in a certain way uh, COVID has put the, and, and as you were mentioning this idea of tying now the environmental with the social on how you react for your strategy, and especially on 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 supply chains. No, um, a lot of companies that had more local, more inclusive, and actually respected human rights and treat well. Uh, had less disruption, you no, know, with the farmers and the sourcing during during the COVID crisis, you no. Know? And he's asking, as a lawyer, he worked in the past that it was very difficult to work on on the different tiers of the of the value chain. Do you think that uh, maybe in the world post COVID, our our supply chains will get shorter to have more control, and can that be a part of a way of of thinking how you can really uh, more efficiently deal with with human rights in the value chain, and we have an, 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 a question from Anish in that point. I I think that yes, if the if the supply chain or the value chain is is shorter, yes, it will be more easy to to actually figure out what's happening. Um, but I, I'm just going to go back to the thing where I went, and that is, it's super important to have processes internal processes linked to your strategy. So that, for instance, when you need to go and investigate what's happening in your supply chain, you have the possibility internally to say, we have been able to verify until supplier, let's say, two or three. Four, five, and six, we still need to do something about. But I think that being transparent and showing accountability in, in those spaces is super important. And that's part of what we call the, the human rights principles. I mean, one of them is really accountability and participation uh, so that you also get the local community, exactly as you say, to participate actively in, for instance, ensuring their human rights, ensuring their labor rights. And if you're open to that, then you might have some bumps because you might have to correct some things you've been doing. But I think simply being open, for instance, to unions, I mean, that will just show that you are actually open to changing things. Uh, and that can be very difficult, especially if you operate in societies where unions are frowned upon. But if you have the power to actually change things internally, then that's something that you can take as a very proactive uh, step. 
still, and I have to say then, then you need to also take in consideration the context where you operate, because if you're risking your life because you are allowing unions, you, 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 it's allow it's allowed for you to weigh those things. That I mean, otherwise, uh, we're not asking to become a marcher on the altar of business and human rights here. And so you're mentioning how important is the, the, the role then of private sectors to respect these, these international standards now. Uh, how can investors then go further that avoid risk and do no harm? And what kind of due diligence uh, they can do if you want uh, to, 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 to standardize the processes internally or to respond to these challenges that, that we had Anish mentioning and others mentioning? You know? Yeah. So what we're doing uh, quite uh, quite concretely with some investors is to to start out really also with their strategy, and it's it's different from a, a business that or a corporation that produces because the the specifically the processes internally will be different. But it's super important that we say okay, we start with strategy and then we create indicators. I can give a concrete example to something that um, I I was suggesting to somebody who's doing specifically microcredits, uh, which is obviously different than if you do bigger investment, and I can talk about that too, is to say, okay, we have decided to invest a lot of our funds in uh, female entrepreneurs. Why? I mean, that, first of all, you need to think about why. Well, first of all, I would guess that is because we all know that female entrepreneurs in very many areas of the world has a harder time uh, starting their businesses because they have a harder time um, participating in civil society, participating in political life, and they will have to take care, for instance, of their children. So investing 80% of your funds in female entrepreneurs is definitely probably having an impact But how do you actually go about and tell, telling that story if you just say, oh, we just invested 80%? You need to go and say, these people are obviously doing a lot of due diligence on the investment so that they are sure that their investors will get a return on the investment in these microcredits or microloans. So in that due diligence, you add, for instance, so how many kids do you have in your family when before we invest? Uh, and how many of these are going to school. So let's say, generally speaking, three per family, one is going to school. We come back a year after and we measure and two of them are going to school because now the mom is actually out working and the kids don't need to have the uh, jobs and the mom has the time to invest in other things than not just her kids, also because she got that micro loan. How has that influenced the woman's participation in civil society issues, in political processes, because she feels empowered. That's something you can ask. And it's quanti qualitative, but you can make it into a quantitative analysis. Um, has, has women, or have women generally gotten better access to healthcare because now they have the power and the confidence to go and say, hey, we have a right to do or simply because now they can pay into health insurance because of these loans. So those are things that you can actually include as indicators and then in your reporting that makes it much more concrete. For bigger investors, um, it's more about saying, for instance, your company they invest in, we are going to set up certain criteria. For instance, having a right space approach allows you also to invest in industries that are really problematic. For instance, the extraction industry. Because if you want to make a change and make the world a better place, and that is part of your motivation, mm -hmm. then then it's not enough to just invest in things that are already jolly good. I mean, if you invest in, for instance, a firm that produces cheese in Switzerland, the rules on labor on I am tempted to say cow welfare uh, in Switzerland are already really high and there's no doubt that the Swiss authorities are really strict. You're not going to have an amazing amount of impact telling these Swiss cheese producers now you need to behave because they probably already do. But if you invest in the mining industry, I mean, that's deep and dirty and that's where you can actually change lives. And having a white space approach allows you to say, look, we know, for instance, that if we have children from five to seven who are going into the cobalt mine. 
Now, in six months, we want to see that age older and we want to see an engagement from you since you're basically running the entire region in getting these kids into school. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, but you can say we want to see an engagement. If I have the six months... Oh, sorry, sorry, keep, keep, sorry, sorry. No, if after six months that hasn't happened, you also need to see why hasn't it happened. Did random or did widespread unrest all of a sudden break out in that area so that the people running the mine felt them, saw themselves confronted with machine guns from morning to the evening for three, for three months straight? That will have a delaying effect. And that's something that you need to, to be able to work with. And then say, okay, if on a, let's say on a, on, on, on a timeline of 12 months, we do not see any real engagement from you, then we will start divesting. That's a huge uh, pressure point. And it's not, it, it's not, um, how do you say, it's not, um, it's, it's pretty pragmatic because you're giving time and you're saying what we really want to see is real engagement and steps towards improvement. So I think uh, what you mentioned is very interesting and 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 example too because we're seeing a lot on the reporting a lot of pressure to put targets. So you see, you identify a problem, you put a target on how you're going to solve it and what date. And the date is not good to put 2050. No, it has to be something that is during your tenure as a as an yeah. executive and in that timeline and how you're going to do it. And as you mentioned in mining. Uh, and investors can divest and also have pressure. And, and we had uh, some discussions here in the, in the webinars too about exclusionary policies, et cetera. Uh, but also, as you mentioned in Convert, it's not only mining, for example, IT companies or, ten, or Tesla, that if, if you buy for a clean energy, cobalt is part of the value chain of cell phones. So, uh, so can also put pressure on part of their value chain. So I think, what do you think about this ecosystem idea of having incorporating the different players? And I think you also have the, the role of policy uh, supporting uh, these kinds of engagements. And we had a, a couple of people, uh, Anton and, and Anish Toussaint and, and Ivan before saying, what happens? We put all this pressure on the private sector but we are seeing a lot of governments actually not signing the ILO conventions or the UK and the EU message of not respecting and some of the internal laws at, at a country level. So how do we go by uh, to really enforce and play with the different lenses from the investor side, from the corporate side and from the policy side? Because I know you have a position of what a good policy is. Yeah. Okay, so let me go, just go back to what you said also about the ecosystem and also of linking E and S again, because for instance, I think a lot of investors would think, oh, I'm investing in the production of solar panels. Catching, yay, this is good, clean energy. But you need to also look at, for instance, how are people being treated in the solar panel production? And also, I mean, th there are real things that need to be weighed. For instance, you can have a production of solar panels in an area where there is, for instance, not enormous amounts of water and you use a lot of water to produce these solar panels. So there are all these things that I think that a bright space approach allows you to look at because it really links everything. And it's a little bit like the SDGs. A lot of SDGs are very intimately connected and it's very rare that you impact only one but that's very rarely captured in, in reporting, actually. So let me bring back to government. One of the reasons, and, and this then becomes a little bit personal, but one of the reasons I decided to, to take the jump out of the UN right now um, is that there is a, a, a feeling in the, and, and I am a huge supporter of the multilateral uh, and I think really, if we didn't have the UN, we would have to invent it. There's a lot of issues, mm -hmm. but it, it needs to be there. Uh, can it be better? Yes. But one of the things right now is that central government is not necessarily where we will see the enormous steps ahead on better sustainability and better, uh, um, better initiatives right now. And but, but the international standards are there. We, and national legislation very often is there. So it is actually a risk. The EU will be coming out with human rights due diligence, which is not only going to affect 
anybody operating on EU territory, it's going to affect all the way down the, the supply chain. Um, we were just in touch actually from, from KPNK with somebody who operates in Egypt and we were talking about this and they were, oh my God, if we are not up to standards on this, then anybody who's using us as a supply chain will have to pull out from Egypt and our industries and we can't have that. Now, first of all, there is a an enormous amount of money in the private sector that is not in government. And, and that's that's power. So I think that two drivers for the private sector to both engage in policy making and also simply to do good. I think it's a risk that there will be enormous fines and there will be enormous pressure from consu consumers if there are human rights violations. Um, two, uh, there is the the need on, or the willingness simply to do good because we're realizing that there is a lot to be done. And we're realizing the power that the private sector has in, in doing something good. So that's sort of like the, there's the stick and carrot. And then uh, also when, when you look at WHO and their budget, which I think is 4 billion or something like that, and the Gates mm. Foundation, which is what, 54 billion? I mean, you can see that right now there's, yeah, there's a lot that the private sector can do that the public sector is not even able to do because of their funding. So I think that there is there are these two major motivators, and that is regulation is coming out, uh, consumer pressure is there, and getting more and more from the millennials and the generations that are younger than me, um, and uh, which, which are many generations by now. Um, <laughs> and then there is the policy. Then there's also the possibility to really engage in policy making because right now I think many both investors and companies, if they engage in the policy making, it's like saying it, it's saying this is too complex or this is going to cost us too much money. And some of the regulation that's coming out is not necessarily feasible or sensible because it's trying to do too much in too little time. So for instance, and, and I'm not getting into specifically the initiative in Switzerland, but if the burden of proof is really reversed so that unless you can prove that in your entire supply chain, nothing is wrong, well, that's not feasible, and that will just make the people or companies are going to move out of Switzerland, where that require to somewhere where that requirement isn't there. But if you actually engage the government from a rights based perspective and say, if you require that of us, we can't make change, then I think that the people sitting in government wanting to do good is actually listening to you. Because if you say we want to make change, but we need to create legislation that allows us to do so on the basis of international standards. So I think that there are very various levels where there is um, a pressure to do good, a willingness to do good, and a possibility to do it, but in a pragmatic way. Thank God. I think we have talked many times, and, and I think it's, it's been very obvious, uh, sometimes the lack of trust in political institutions and even multilateral organizations to solve, hopefully the US will come back to the Paris Agreement, but we know that um, the problems are not only going to be solved in this multilateral agreement that we had uh, maybe some hope in the past. And this is, as you mentioned, putting a lot of pressure also on, on corporates, but at the same time, giving them an opportunity to have a voice, to differentiate themselves, to innovate. Uh, and also, again, from who they are, as you're saying, you know, we are used to think about corporates talking to the public sector as lobbying and to actually to be something bad to get uh, to flexibilize regulation. And what you're talking is a very different mindset. It's saying, okay, become a player to, to, to add value on how can we do better. We all have these objectives to not violate human rights, to respect and to flourish, even though that's not a right, but that's at the end what we want. You no, know? we want a society and a planet that can flourish. Um, how do what do we bring as the actors we are the different to the to the to the table? And I think we we were doing some research with Patrick on, on blended finance on that, on how can you mix, for example, how the international organizations can broker trust, how philanthropic investors can de-risk projects, how private money can scale. So uh, probably that's part of what 
we're trying to do with with the webinars is called who you are, what do you bring to the table, and yeah. how can you build the market. So just because time flies uh, <laughs> with your having fun, we have like just four minutes. So if you wanted to put out some takeaways or some some lesson learned in in your experience on on embedding uh, human rights into strategy, what would you say? What should companies uh, start, or what are your some takeaways that you want people to have? I think that first of all, really, I, I've heard so many times. I mean, also from government officials, oh, human rights are just principles. No, but all human rights are binding law for states, and they have been incorporated into national legislation. So, if, for instance, you violate and you exploit somebody, in most states, that's actually a criminal offense. You can end up in prison for it. But that's one thing. But also to say they're really concrete. I mean, if you think about your own life, we I, I simply because of where and when I was born, my rights have always been respected. I, I had a house. Uh, it was warm in winter. It was cold in summer because I grew up in Denmark. So the summers were always cold. Um, I had food. I had free education. I had access to health care. And that made me somebody who has made informed choices and I had choices. So I think it's really also a question when I, when I close down tonight after 10 hours of Zoom, and I'm not exaggerating today, I will sort of go for a walk. I will feel safe because I live in a state where generally speaking, human rights are respected. So you don't feel that you will be arbitrarily detained and tortured or that you will run out of food and I will come back and will close my door and I will have my right to privacy. So I think if we all really think about that, we realize how important this framework actually is for us on a, um, on, on a daily basis. And then also say that uh, the best thing to do then is to have policies and strategies that make these rights so concrete that you can link your indicators to them and you can report and you can really show what you're doing and you can engage on medium and long-term goals because this is not about changing the day from or changing the world from one day to another. It's about communicating about the choices that you make to stay in certain situations, to invest in the extraction industry, to invest in tobacco if you want to, because those who work in tobacco also need to be protected. So I think it open up a, a whole area of, of investment opportunities that will move towards better implementation, but it also really allows you to discuss on why you're not doing this from one day to another in a transparent and an accountable way. And I think that's extremely important because it will allow you to not divest in many situations, actually. So thank you so much, Christina. It's almost 12. Yes. Uh, and it was very enlightening. And I think also a, a very important issue, and as we are starting to think about how we invest with the gender lens, how we include diversity and inclusions in the middle of Black Lives Matter, if you want movement, and we try to understand what the private sector can bring to the table, I really thank you for bringing uh, to, to our audience these important issues, and I call, obviously, on on, on, on everybody to, to see again how proactive and intentionally can in, embed uh, human rights and S in general into your strategy. And, and obviously count on me as a partner in crime in any of these uh, initiatives. So thank you, Christina, very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank and you we'll so have, much for having me. You're welcome. See you around. Good. Bye. And stay safe, thank people, you. please. Stay safe. Good. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You so much.